Hi. <laughs> um, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. Thanks, Rick, for the sweet intro. There you go. Back there. Um, <laughs> thank you to the Hannah Grimes Center, Radically Rural, for hosting this conversation. And thank you to our panel, who I'll introduce to you all today, right now. Josh Emig, he's an architect, researcher, co-founder of Network Communities, head of product at Kanoa. Wave, say hi. Um, Ashley Bowling, festival organizer in Telluride, Colorado. And according to your email, SIG, a full-time dreamer. I love that. Um, Ashley. Um, and we're very lucky today to have with us the organizer of this gathering, Mary Ann Christensen, executive director of the Hannah Graham Center for Entrepreneurship. Thanks, Mary Ann, for making the time. I'm sure you have a million things to do. But hopefully, it's running by itself by this point. Awesome. Um, I'm Derek. Rick introduced me. So um, the only thing I'll add is today I'll be your moderator. And um, I'll just uh, kick off today's session. Um, actually, all the panelists will present for, we'll try to keep it to like 45 minutes. Then we'll do a group exercise in which we'll explore some of the things that we've talked about in the panel. Um, and then uh, we'll round off with a QA. and a um, so Try to save about 30 minutes for that. So to get us going, um, Josh and I have been working on a, um, a research project around this. It's very work in progress, but uh, we're exploring the potential of gathering to spur lasting economic impact and revitalization in rural communities. And that's what we'd like to give you a sneak peek into today. So as the world considers how to resume the business of being human in a post-COVID world, one of the biggest challenges that hangs over us is negotiating the new perils of social interaction. In a world where shaking hands has become a brush with death, death, how will we be together again? And second consideration is an opportunity. How to capitalize on the energy we see in the geographic redistribution enabled by remote work and propelled by this existential threat. And um, we share in Rick's optimism um, that he shared with us yesterday, um, that in the wake of this new reality lies great opportunity for rural places, if done correctly. So to dig into why we've zeroed in on gathering specifically, we need to go back around 11,000 years. Uh, it's generally accepted that farming is why, um, what enabled humans to stop being nomadic hunter-gatherers and to settle down into permanent, settle permanent settlements. The assumption often being that the technology, agriculture, spawned the settlement. That once our ancestors no longer needed to chase their food, that of course villages, towns, and cities followed. But if tending fields came before settlement, then how did the tenders of those fields live? And what was the impetus for this major lifestyle change? Consider that we've been, at this point, hunter-gatherers for around 100,000 years already. So perhaps, perhaps there was a reason for creating settlements that precipitated the need for farming. And this Neolithic era temple in Turkey, considered the first human-built monument, suggests that it may have been the desire to create a place for gathering that necessitated the invention of agriculture. The remains of the temple at Gobekli Tepe, Tepe in modern day Turkey are 6,000 years older than, the, uh, than Stonehenge, yet eerily resemble Stonehenge in both form and purpose, as it likely grew visitors from afar for religious gathering. The location and carbon dating are significant because they placed Gobekli Tepe in a time when most humans were still hunter gatherers. But, it's on the northern edge of the Fertile Crescent, birthplace of agriculture, cities, and complex societies. This collection of carved monoliths, some 20 feet tall, would have taken hundreds of people to carve, erect, and arrange in a time preceding most tools, farming methods, the domestication of animals, and even permanent dwellings. Further, most tribes at the time were probably not even large enough to carry this out on their own, so that means that they had to come to an agreement in the region between tribes to collaborate on this construction over many years and then to come together in the festivals it would host. So could it have been that this collective desire of the area's nomadic tribes, tribes to build a place for religious gathering that necessitated, necessitated a solution to feeding that workforce over many years? And that perhaps it might have led to the honing of the skills and technologies needed for agriculture to cultivate wild grains and domesticate animals, which then might have spread through the Fertile Crescent, led to the construction of agricultural villages and soon after the first cities. This Herculean effort some 6,000 years ago before, 6,000 years before the invention of writing even, 
speaks to how deep our need for gathering, meaning, and place truly runs. Closer to home on our own continent, early Native American villages again emerged as a place for nomadic peoples to come together and strengthen tribal bonds. One researcher writes, villages brought the otherwise nomadic tribes together seasonally to hear stories of elders, to share in, relig in ritual feasts, dances, renewal. And then many years later, in early colonial America, we see how gathering and settlement are intertwined in the arrangement and programming of early towns. The town common, the village green, the square, the market, the church, the meeting house, the court. All these are inseparable from our notion of what a small New England town is and played a critical role in the evolution of what community in America would look like. But today, gatherings take many forms. Arts and culture festivals, academic conferences, business and corporate events, and hybrids of all of those. Gatherings we most readily think of are cyclical in nature. They often are in the same place and come to be synonymous with that place. As a result, today we have a booming events industry, at least we did 18 months ago, and I'm sure we will again soon. Um, and even events, uh, event tourism and festivalization more and more are becoming a part of public policy, which I think Ashley will touch on later today. But we argue that for a community to take advantage of this moment, we need to consider our approach through the lens of the values shift that some have called the experience economy, wherein people, yes, many of them millennials, are generally more willing to pay for experiences than products, which is driving many companies today to reconsider their products as experiences. And the economists that originated this term propose a sweet spot of experiences that consumers are seeking, which balances um, entertainment, education, aesthetics, and escapism. And three, three gatherings immediately come to mind that capture and perhaps even shape this era. So no discussion of experience and gathering today can ignore the significance of Burning Man, a nine-day nine pop-up city of 70,000 people on the playa, a dried, a dried lake bed in Nevada's Black Rock Desert. Driven by an ethos of no spectators, the event composed of experimental art and music and interactive installations is almost entirely created by those attending. Anyone been down to Burning Man here? Yes. Um, so people I've talked to that come back talk about it as a transformative experience. Um, and some, some even argue that the radical art and interactions experimented with here, which began in the Bay Area, are inseparable from the culture and innovation in Silicon Valley and have reverberations in the technology they create, which goes on to shape all of our lives. Likewise, South by Southwest, what began as a local music festival has evolved into a 10-day citywide immersive event, including music, film, interactive media, panel discussions, a trade show, and so much more. Anybody been to South by here? No? Uh, one journalist summarized South by as saying that it, it promulgated the notion that one does not go to an event as part of a day, rather that the entirety of each day must provide opportunities to discover something new. It's basically saying, that it's like City of Austin is the venue and um, also an immersive agenda. Like you don't need to go walk around and get a piece of paper, you just stumble into things. And finally, Sturgis, a South Dakota town of 6,000 people, which for 10 days swells to a population of half a million with an economic impact estimated to be a billion dollars. The name of the town is inseparable from the motorcycle rally it hosts. Anyone been to Sturgis? Yes. Um, so, and does anybody know how it started? So it was, um, a, it was a, um, a motor, a, in 1938, a motorcycle dealer in Sturgis started having races on the main street in 1938. Um, it's like an, ex, it's like an early uh, experiment in, ex, in experiential marketing. And anyways, it grew from there. And today, if you're serious about writing, it's the kind of thing you have to experience at some point in your life. At least that's what I'm told. I'm not allowed to have a motorcycle. <laughs> um, so, what can we learn from all this? Well, we know that the past few decades have not been kind to small and mid-sized American towns and rural communities. Export of man manufacturing jobs overseas, the decimation of farming by big ag and cheap food imports, disinvestment, basic infrastructure, and the brain drain, a phrase used to describe the export of bright, ambitious rural youth to colleges that prepared them for knowledge economy jobs, most of those in large coastal cities and metro areas. Now, I think we can all agree how dangerous it, it is to lump together 60 million people spread across 3 million square miles into one generalization, but it's hard to argue with the data. 
that rural America as a whole is getting older, less affluent, and less populated. And as a result, we have a fractured society. The zero-sum game of culture wars between the beneficiaries of this new knowledge economy, cities, and everywhere else that is left behind, with each side retreating further and further into its own bubble, while COVID has ruptured the comfort of these bubbles. And city dwellers have retreated to the countryside, many of them back to their parents' suburban and exurban homes. Downtowns lie eerily sleepy while knowledge workers dial into meetings from their often childhood bedrooms. What might all this mean for small town America? And further, what does gathering have to do with it? So gathering let's define as coming together for a common purpose. And for our purposes, we'll focus on planned gatherings of a certain scale larger than say 500 people. This is kind of arbitrary cut up. Um, it may take the form of a festival or celebration, an arts or a cultural showcase, a forum for intellectual ideas and exchange, a congregation of people around a shared identity, an assembly of business or trades, or as often the case, some combination of one or more of these. And for our discussion, we're thinking of towns from two to 50,000 people, Cold Springs, or uh, sorry, <laughs> Lost Springs, you don't make the cut. Um, and yes, I know some of you may argue that 50,000 is not exactly small, but for our conversation, it still works, I think. Um, and finally, location is important. We're focused on places outside the connected web of large metropolitan commuter rails and highways and bedroom communities that serve urban conurbations. But it's also other factors like density and even state of mind. Some communities within a metro region might still identify as rural due to some history or shared self-image. So our proposal is that gatherings can be leveraged to revitalize, re-energize, and reinvent rural communities. And we do not mean bringing $10 lattes and vintage clothing stores and Pilates studios to every main street. Our goal is not to gentrify, but to capitalize on that energy coming into many of the small towns in this moment and to strengthen community identity economic self-determination, and a sense of place. What we're talking about is resilience. We want to explore how community, place, and gathering can work together to create resilient communities. One measure of success we often hear about when talking about this is creating communities where our kids can stay, find work, buy a home, and have a future. So how can gathering do this? When we think of hosting events and the related economic benefits, it's tempting to think about these in terms of the benefits of to hospitality and entertainment industry specifically. Certainly this is one of the upsides, but it's only a small part of the potential positive effects. We're proposing that gathering can, have, can be leveraged to trigger lasting impacts on local economies in more diverse and resilient ways, particularly if events are considered for their strategic advantage. To tease this out a bit further, let's consider a town's relationship to events as falling into one of two categories, which will distinguish as town as venue versus endogenous events. We're still working on the terminology, but. Um, when a conference such as Radically Rural is hosted in Keene, uh, the town of Keene serves as a venue and local businesses are supported. This is not unlike a hotel's conference floor with uh, nearby event services and catering companies benefiting from uh, working in and near that location. In a venue, when the event is over, evidence of the people, ideas, and cultural artifacts are swept away and cleared for the next event. But What's more interesting about Radically Rural and Keene, actually, is that Radically Rural is a product of the Hannah Grimes Center, a local institution whose self-stated mission is to provide space, tools, and connections that entrepreneurs need to build strong businesses, thriving local economies, vibrant communities in the region. So tomorrow, when most of us that have gathered here have gone home, the Hannah Grimes Center will remain, continuing the thought leadership for the people of this place. The conference is an incubator for ideas that will remain here and strengthen the community. Marianne will hopefully talk more about this later. And I would argue that our ideas about Keen, in, in my imagination and yours, have been changed by our experience here. I know when I talk about Keen to my colleagues back home, I'm going to talk about it as a place that is entrepreneurial and thinking progressively about rural living. That this event is building and reinforcing an idea about this place, which will spread, as ideas tend to do, through people gathering here and the interactions they have afterwards. I've mentioned several times now the idea of place, which is worth digging into a little bit. Now, place can be considered the linking up of geography and meaning, which is created by shared experiences over time. When this identity resonates with others and translates to compelling narratives in a larger cultural imagination, it can draw people to a place. Likewise, if this identity resonates with locals, it can be the glue that bonds a community together, creating reasons for investing in it, 
for building new institutions and compelling our kids to stay or return to build their futures. Placemaking is a theme that's come up in other discussions here this week, but we'd like to call your attention to the role of gathering in the establishment of place. Think of Aspen and how synonymous it is with the Aspen Ideas Festival and the Aspen Institute, and Austin and South by Southwest's role in solidifying it as an established tech hub, Apple, Google, Facebook, and many others. Most big tech shops have set up shop in Austin uh, to draw on the talent that has flocked there. And now I would venture to guess that most of the conferences that many of you have been to have been in venues like this one in a hotel uh, multi-purpose room that most would describe as, describe as placeless and interchangeable while being located in a city which, was like, which likely had a high degree of placeness while being, uh, oops, sorry, and is often the real reason why the conference was hosted in the location it was. Yet we spend hours and hours in that dark venue breathing each other's air, by the way, instead of being immersed in the uniqueness of the place. Which is what makes this particular moment unique and potentially a watershed moment. We've all read the news about people fleeing cities for suburbs and countryside. There is a fear of density in closed environments and a lure to the outdoors and a slower way of life. As people consider, consider how to return some version of normal and fulfill our needs gather, whether for social, cultural, academic, or business purposes, we are weary of these dark, closed-door, windowless rooms and are drawn to natural envir environs and healing greenery and plenty of light and fresh air. Furthermore, most of these new folks don't have roots in their new communities yet, so some social infrastructures, to borrow a term from Sarah, earlier, um, highlighted, yes, highlighted yesterday's keynote, are needed to create cohesion, align on purpose, and compel them to feel connected and invest in the new places they call home. Rural communities have an opportunity now to create a different kind of gathering, one that immerses, <coughs> one that is immersive um, and authentic experiences to residents and guests while resulting in residual social and economic placemaking effects for their communities. The energy is there to harness this opportunity. It's worth considering how gatherings might sustain, reinvent, or create place in our communities. And what does our specific community specifically need to thrive? And how might we use the energy of gatherings to meet those needs? Before I hand it over to um, Josh to answer that question, you've got to figure it out right now. Um, I'd like to end on a case study from a little corner, of my little corner of the world, Hudson Valley. Um, and a gathering we have there every year, the Sheep and Wool Festival in Rhinebeck. Uh, now, the Hudson Valley was once a hub of sheep farming, wool, and textiles production, but the industry has long since moved on overseas. But latent potential still exists in the infrastructure, the former factories, the location, the proximity to New York City, the fashion industry, and human capital. There are people there with weaving and textile production skills. The festival began as a bread use sale, but in recent years has sort of reinvented itself, adding more of a focus on consumers and hobbyists energized by a budding crafts and fabric arts movement. This is a great move strategically, and now the next step we're arguing is how might that festival be leveraged to help bring back and reinvent a nascent industry for a new generation interested in this art and craft? What if, fest what if the festival is more immersive like Burning Man, more multidisciplinary and integrated into the town like South by Southwest? What lasting effects might the energy of that gathering bring to the Hudson Valley, and what does your version of this look like? Thanks. So, uh, as Derek said, I have it all figured out. So, um, first, thanks, Derek. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Marianne, and, and Radically Rural for having me here and giving me the opportunity to, to delve into this topic. Um, in this section, I'm just going to dig a little bit deeper into a lot of the things that Derek introduced into the intersection of gathering and place. We'll look at a few ways that gatherings are commonly evaluated. We'll look at some practical considerations. And I want to close with some thoughts on developing a strategic view of gatherings or events, by which I mean looking beyond just the merits of the content and the immediate impact, which is important, but looking beyond toward ways in which events might be, uh, might be curated by communities to advance longer term outcomes. Now, you may note that I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on challenges and negative impacts. Those certainly exist, but we're going to stay in the realm of the radically aspirational and optimistic here. Um, so our thesis is that events that are rooted, that are authentic and built on the endogenous strengths of a town or region will contribute over longer durations to a sense of place, to community identity, to the development of social infrastructure, 
and longer term economic development. So I want to start with placemaking. The idea of using place or placemaking to drive development is really not a new idea. But as Derek pointed out, things have changed, and it would seem that there's some new opportunity for rural places and small towns. Uh, Richard Florida continues this quote, saying, the location of talent will be even more important. In cities and suburbs and rural areas, the terms of the competition will be about competing for talent, competing for workforce, competing for people, and competing for remote work. So there's a lot of data out there on COVID era migration patterns. On the one hand, the data tells a story that smaller, more affordable towns are being given some advantage after decades of consolidation and growth that really primarily benefited large metros. The spike on the right on this graph is the net migration of people from high cost large metros to the areas represented on the plot. The red line represents small metros, towns, and rural areas. The story the graph isn't telling is the number of people who are not moving. Who are, not leave, who are not moving to large metros, which is to say those who are staying put, passing on the high salary gig in New York or San Francisco in favor of building or contributing to the economy where they already are. Now I'll take off my mask. All right. <laughs> Something felt funny. <laughs> but there's some debate on whether remote work will truly have as large an impact as has been predicted. Partially because the net out migration of people from high cost to large metros would still have to increase pretty significantly to have a real kind of uniform impact on the labor force in most places. Also in terms of where people are going, it seems that most of the COVID era migrants aren't moving to the heartland, quote unquote. They're moving just a bit further away from the cities that they already inhabit. But this story isn't over. According to the Cleveland Fed, out-migration from large, high-cost metros increased again in the second quarter of 2021. So more far-flung places may not see a flood of people, but it's not a reason to be pessimistic. Most of these models rely on an extrapolation of current patterns, which could change again. Also, the numbers say nothing of what the new migrants will do when they arrive in their new communities. And again, they say little of the people who have stayed put. So the nature of network effects is that small changes can have outsized impacts over time. So the question for communities is how to attract new ideas, new people while investing in the people and the strengths that are already there. For some people, $10,000 in cash and contributions might be a powerful attractor, but we think that making vibrant, attractive, quality places is also a powerful attractor that brings in the new and retains the people who have already fallen in love with the place. In our research for Radically Rural, we looked, at, looked for some evidence of this effect and found this study from 2010 carried out by the Knight Foundation along with Gallup. It focuses on community attachment, which is an emotional connection to a place that transcends satisfaction, loyalty, or even passion. Among other things, attached residents are less likely to want to leave than residents without this emotional connection. Carried out over several years, the study showed a strong positive correlation between GDP growth, population growth, and this community attachment. The graph here shows a precipitous drop in GDP and population growth at about 3.7 on their five-point scale, where one is very low attachment and five is very high attachment. The study also looks at the attributes that are most highly correlated with high levels of attachment. In the three years over which the study was conducted, social offerings, openness, and aesthetics round out the top three attributes. Now, we know that correlation doesn't mean causation. However, understanding that these attributes tend to go hand in hand with growth and community attachment is both revealing and relevant to policy. Tying back to gathering, we believe that taking a more strategic versus opportunistic approach to events and event planning can become a key contributor to social offerings and openness and perhaps the aesthetic as well. So as a field, event studies cast a broad net around the nature of events and the impacts they have, ranging from the philosophical and the theoretical to the most practical. And while we don't have the time or space to cover much of this, we can carve out a few swaths that might help in the development of local strategies for event curation, design, and planning. And so I'm gonna work through a bit of a framework here based on these, these these three areas, value impact, practical needs, uh, and place strategy, just as a way to start to think about events, especially once we get to um, the exercise that we're going to do today. So we'll start with measures of value and impact. These are often projected in order to validate the viability of events, or they're measured afterwards to gauge performance and future viability. 
So the, probably the most common way of assessing the potential and the performance of events is through their economic impact on a geographic area. And this typically looks at things like sales, overall GDP, employment, and tax revenue. And standard practice is to look at the total economic impact as the sum of direct, indirect, and in induced economic effects of events. So simplify, direct impact is the money that people spend at the event. Indirect impact is the money that businesses spend with each other in order to meet that demand. And induced impact is the money earned by workers due to this economic activity that then gets respent in the community. And so this is typically how economic impact analysis looks at these things. And so just a bit about the graph, this is Canfield Fair, uh, economic in, from a Canfield Fair economic impact study. This is about a 7,000 person community outside of uh, Youngstown, Ohio. So it's kind of related to a larger community. Youngstown is about 70,000 people. Um, this lasts six days. And in 2021, even post COVID, it had an attendance of 285. So it's a relatively small community with relatively large gathering, even if you consider it in the terms of uh, things like uh, the, the events that, that, that Derek mentioned. So peak daily attendance here in 2021 was about 70,000. 70,000 people. While the economic impact or an, at least an acceptable financial outcome is certainly critical, it has also become important to assess the value and impact of events across non-economic dimensions. And there's many ways to think about these. On one end of the spectrum, it's practical and measurable. It's whether or not a particular event changed people's minds or behaviors or whether they simply enjoyed it or not. At the other end, theorists look at deeper, deeper longer-term social and historical value that events offer to individuals, communities, and society more broadly. So asked to rank the social impact dimensions in terms of their overall importance to policymaking, event professionals and academics express the following. As you can see, a few of these are time-bound in the event itself and probably have some economic reverberations, but most of them point to deeper, longer-term community um, uh, attributes, something like quality of life, well-being, and social capital. And I just wanted to kind of also just bring back this slide for a second um, and note the ways in which gatherings can actually contribute um, to these critical dimensions. Moving on, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least acknowledge the practical and logistical needs of events. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Um, Ashley, who's coming up next, will have a much more intimate knowledge uh, and be able to speak to these kinds of constraints. But I did want to mention that there's pretty strong alignment between the practical requirements for event hosting and the general requirements for building and maintaining Main Street infrastructure. And some actually see events as an opportunity to advance more conventional infrastructural or street improvements in, in, small, in, in towns and communities. Now on to the strategic. When I say strategic placemaking, I'm looking at events as goal-driven middle to long-term investments in community and place versus more reactionary tactical approaches to placemaking, which are also important. Um, and I want to start by looking at the potential effects of events on community connections and relationships based on a couple of variables. First, reach. Reach refers to the distance that people would travel to attend an event or a gathering. Could be within a town, a couple of miles, could be the entire world. Size is pretty self-explanatory, and it matters. So does duration, how long an event takes over it takes. Is it hours or days, is it weeks? And frequency. And these variables, when they add up, can create event profiles that support community goals in different ways. So for instance, a small to medium event with a local reach, short duration that uh, has high frequency, uh, these types of events have been termed iterative events, and according to one author, they tend to strengthen existing structures and network connections, providing moments when people can bond. So a note on networks and the network terminology, very close-knit clusters or communities are characterized by a high number of connections per person. Uh, if you are in a tightly-knit community, you probably know a lot of other people in that community, which means you have a lot of connections to, to, to other people. And so these connections in those types of uh, clusters tend to be stronger, which is to say people know each other better. And high connection social clusters also tend to exhibit higher levels of feelings of trust, belonging, and reciprocity, or what's known as social capital. So what we're saying then is that events that have shorter reach but iterate 
or in the peak over time can have a reinforcing effect on these uh, connections in these communities. At the other end of the continuum are pulsar events. These types of events connect local communities to a larger, potentially global, flow of people and ideas. In network terms, the connections here are weak, which is probably most easily understood as acquaintances. The term weak is not a value judgment. These connections are incredibly important to the diffusion of information and ideas. They're the bridges that connect disparate parts of networks, shortening the distances between people. For instance, the majority of people who switch jobs, and this is, this is actually true, uh, find out about their new role through an acquaintance, through a weak tie. These bridges are also responsible for things like virality and small world networks, known more colloquially as the six degrees of separation phenomenon, or six degrees of Kevin Bacon, if you prefer. I don't think the students are here today. I was afraid I was going to have to explain through who Kevin Bacon is. <laughs> uh, I'm assuming everybody knows who he is. <laughs> So obviously there's a whole spectrum that consists of dialing up or dialing down any of these variables. What this does is add a sort of meta layer to an event strategy, not just what an event's content contributes to a community's economy or culture, but also how different formats of events can yield different outcomes in terms of community dynamics. And I want to close by touching on three key considerations that figure prominently in a community's ability to achieve longer term goals through events and also in the intensity of demands that they have on those communities. So firstly, site. Why is this important? Choosing to host an event in town or in a commons or on Main Street offers possibility of more engagement with local businesses and puts the event, its participants, and community members in close proximity. And so we believe that it offers more opportunities to use gathering to sustain, reinvent, and create sites. But it also presents more challenges in terms of services or logistics. Out-of-town locations offer the opportunity for more centralized logistics and services, easier access, and potentially greater capacity. But there's a risk that the event becomes less integrated with the place. Eventfulness is not just a colloquial term, but is often used in event literature to describe the aggregate number and frequency of events that a community hosts. So communities with capacity may choose to develop an event portfolio a mix of gatherings that address a range of interests, needs, and community goals. Other communities may choose to focus on fewer or even one flagship event that offers the possibility of engagement and ideally employment spread out over a longer term and leading up to the event. Eventfulness also relates to this last category, which Derek mentioned earlier, and I'm going to call quote unquote rootedness. So rootedness speaks to the degree in which the gatherings or events are rooted in the history or identity of a particular place. So to lift the curtain a bit, we did have quite a few discussions on this terminology, but the, the gist is this. Town as venue refers to focus on creating the platform and infrastructure to host a series of events throughout a year or season. There's an assumption here on the very end of this continuum that the venue is more agnostic to content and more open to events that have no real link to place. The practical demands and impacts here on the community can be intense, but so can the economic upside. Endogenous events is our term for gatherings that emerge from the cult history, culture, and identity of the place and serve to reinforce that identity while also offering opportunities to transform it over time. So just to kind of reiterate a few of the main points here, which I hope you'll take with you into the exercise. Uh, rem remote work, one, remote work may not save the heartland, but people are on the move and towns should be thinking about how to attract the new and keep the residents that they have. Two, the impact of events goes beyond the economic, and they can be powerful forces and expressions of community identity and values. Three, the variables and considerations from size to site choice can be instrumental in affecting community fabric beyond notions of the isolated success of a single event itself. And as a strategy for events that build on existing community strengths in industry, identity, or history have a better chance of contributing over time to a strong sense of place uh, and, and community attachment. And so I, I don't want to overstate like the, 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 the rooted or the venue versus the uh, endogenous. I don't want to bias it too much because I think that, that most places probably exist on some sort of continuum or some sort of hybrid of the two. And Ashley's going to tell us about Telluride, uh, which has built essentially an event machine of sorts, but also has 
um, some very rich and rooted events as, as part of uh, as part of their overall portfolio. And I just want to close with uh, the last observation that I want to, the last observation that I want to leave you with is that the real potential for Main Street is to begin to collapse the consideration of both the event and the place into one of experience, tying back into what Derek was saying about uh, experiences as well. Whether rocking out at a concert, enjoying local food, visiting a library or town square, or crossing the Main Street for that matter, the accumulation of experience is what adds meaning to geography over time. We should remember that the soul of a place reverberates in every footfall on every sidewalk. And so gathering just offers an opportunity to distill that experience, to concentrate it, to package it, to celebrate it, and to share it. Thanks. Good morning. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Bowling. I'm the Director of Colorado. I'd like to thank uh, Derek and Josh. I'd like to thank Rick Extra. I'd like to thank uh, Marianne. And thanks for being here. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank uh, Caitlin and Cooper and Todd for being our technical wizards to make things look and sound good up here and out over the internet. So thank you so much for your dedication and being here. I would also like to take just a moment to acknowledge the Native Americans who used to live here. There are a number of names around here that are Native American names. We, right here, right now, are not the first people to live here, and we certainly won't be the last. And uh, I think all too often, uh, indigenous people and Native Americans uh, don't get the respect and acknowledgement that they deserve. Menhad Neck Mountain, that's an Indian name, or Dan said. Nantucket, Massachusetts. There are lots and lots of Native American names for mountains and rivers and places around here. So, acknowledgement and thanks to uh, people who came here before us. So, I want to give you a, a brief history of Tyrac Colorado, where I grew up in Virginia. I'm transplanted from the people in mountain ski towns in the Rockies. And I've lived in Tyrac now longer than I've lived any place else. I've been there, I'm just over 31 years. So, I want to start with a bit of history. Tundra, Colorado started as a mining town. I'm going to back up. The youth Native Americans gathered and visited the valley that we now call, the white East called Tundra, Colorado, certainly for hundreds, if not thousands of years before 1872. That was a pivotal, uh, pivotal year. In the summer of 1872, uh, eight people of European extraction wandered by accident following the river into the headwaters of the valley that's now Tyrite, Colorado. And there have been human inhabitants year-round in Tyrite ever since 1872. The population has fluctuated wildly depending on the economy. In the mid-1960s, Tyrite, Colorado was being very seriously considered for induction into the Colorado Ghost Town Hall of Fame. There were roughly 350 people who lived in Telluride in the 1960s, pre-festivals, pre area pre uh, most people in the world having ever heard the name Telluride. In the four-year period from 1900 through 1904, Telluride realized its greatest population to date. More people lived in the Telluride Valley. People by 1895, 1895, some East Coast politicians lobbied Congress, and they threw out the silver monetary standard and adopted the gold standard. Guess what happened to the price of silver overnight? It crashed. In 1895, when the Sherman Act was passed to get off the silver monetary standard and adopt the gold standard, um, Telluride was 100% invested in silver mining. I'll put that in context. In 1895, there were 2,700 people living in Telluride. One year later, 1896, 400 people. In 12 months, the population went from 2,700 to 400. I think it's safe to say, of the 400 or so people who were still there, they didn't have the resources to get out of that valley. And um, people got together in 1896 and said, if we don't get something going, this will be a ghost town in another year. There's no reason for any 
doesn't want to stay here. There's no economy. We're having a hard time eating. There's nothing to do here. And someone said, okay, we need to pivot. We need to reinvent ourselves. If the price of silver is dropped and we can't be a silver mining town anymore, then why don't we switch to gold? And it's a lot of gold in the market. And all of a sudden, the population grew again. And that gold mining really drove the highest population I've done so far, over 5,000 people at the turn of the century, two centuries ago. So, in, um, in many respects, Tyre has had to adapt, Tyre has had to pivot, look to the future, and it's always been human ingenuity that's driven those changes. People gathered, the Native Americans gathered to hunt elk and deer as a seasonal hunting grounds prior to the discovery of silver by people of European extraction. When the bottom fell out of one market, people pivoted and they moved to another market. So from, nine, from 1872 through 1978, 106 years, there was mining and milling in Tyre. There hasn't been any large scale industrial mining or milling since 1978. And there's always been speed in there. There's always been snow, there's always been mountains. We have snow on the ground in Tyre. Typically about seven months out of the year, from sometime in October to sometime in May. It can snow 12 months out of the year. The miners used to joke. Well, in Tyre, you have 10 months of winter and two months of poor sledding. And some of that is true. It has snowed on the 4th of July parade before. So people decided to capitalize on the winter climate through outdoor recreation. And in 1972, um, a real estate developer, Attorney from Southern California started the modern Telluride ski area. So that was a tremendous economic boost to the winter economy. But there wasn't much happening in the summer. And so, another not mining slash mining photo. Uh, two years after the ski area opened up, ski area opened up Thanksgiving Day, 1972. In the spring of 1974, some innovative, progressive, forward thinking people, the miners would have called those people, let's still call those people the newcomers or hippies or college dropouts or ski bums who showed up, decided we've got to get something going in the summers or else this will just be a winter economy and it will be dead as a doormat. We'll get some hikers, we'll get some jeepers. We'll get the people who come from the natural beauty of this place, but what's going to drive our summer economy? And people got the brilliant idea of hosting festivals. So five festivals started in the summer of 1974. Four of them are still going strongly. And those festivals that started in the summer of 1974 with the Tyre Bluegrass Music Festival, the third weekend of June, that's the largest attended, the largest audience comes to Tyre. About 15,000 people to come to a community that's normally about 4,000 people. And there's some nice headaches that go with that, as uh, Josh and Eric alluded to. Also, the Telluride Film Festival, the Telluride Chamber Music Festival, a festival that has gone by the wayside called the Aaron's Rendezvous, it was a hang run festival, and the Iron Jew Mass Run, which is a 17.1 mile run from the town of Uray. Over, up and over the second highest vehicular pass in North America, 13,114 feet above sea level, down to uh, the finish line in Tugger. Not everybody who drives it finishes. And that just happened the second Saturday of, um, of September up in MC at the finish line for 31 years in a row. I can never run it. So, uh, other festivals have added to that portfolio of festivals in Tugger. There is now a festival every weekend from Memorial Day through the first weekend of October, except for one second weekend in July. And that is now a sanctioned festival called the Nothing Festival, or Nothing Festival. Except for the naked bikes that go around here. People wear nothing, ride their bikes up and down the street to uh, celebrate the Nothing Festival. So, Tyrite has developed this winter economy with tourism and outdoor recreation, snowboarding and skiing and snowshoeing and snowmobiling and all those fun things that people like to do. And this summer festival economy 
So I mentioned some of the modular festivals. I mentioned festivals that started in 1974. But now there's a yoga festival. There's a wine festival. There's a higher moon festival. There is a rock and roll festival called The Ride. Fourth uh, of July is a big event. It's kind of developed into its own festival. There is the Mountain Film Festival, the Tyrant Film Festival. There is a horror film festival. There's a Cars and Colors uh, festival. So on and so forth. And, uh, there's a Mushroom Festival in Tyrant. And boy, that festival really draws a unique uh, group of people from all over the world who, who wind up there. So there are tremendous economic benefits to the town of Tyrite, to the community, in terms of lodging, in terms of transportation, in terms of food and beverage, in terms of uh, gross domestic happiness for a lot of people uh, in that area. But there's some drawbacks too in terms of communication towers for cell phones that get overloaded when there are 15,000 people in a community all trying to text and, uh, and do things on their personal devices. That overloads the infrastructure and it sometimes takes hours for a text to go through or for you to receive a text or you try to make a phone call on a cell phone and it can't be completed. Our wastewater treatment plant gets overburdened by the sheer number of extra people that are putting demands on that. The Good Friend Line Works uh, is not a very wastewater treatment plant, and they have a very accurate age, and they can tell with a, a pretty good degree of accuracy how many flushes per day, how many people are actually using the wastewater treatment uh, plant, um, and that gauges uh, the stress on our utilities and on the resources. Uh, I mentioned there are about 4,000 people who live year round uh, in the Tyra community. Last year, during COVID 19, and we didn't have in person festivals, but people still came to Tyra. Um, it was between 17 and 19,000 flushes or user persons that were recorded in the wastewater treatment plant. The maximum capacity is about 19,500, and we were stressing that resource almost to its breaking point. And there were no festivals last summer. Every weekend last summer was the equivalent or greater than a normal in person festival. And I was just towards coming to what they thought escape pandemic situations in places like Houston or San Diego or Chicago, and coming to the rarefied air of the mountains in the San Juan Mountains of uh, southwestern Colorado. So our water supply, our wastewater, is stressed by the festivals and there are accurate gauges as to that stress. There are gauges and there are statistics and demographics about uh, grocery stores and availability of food products, uh, stress on our electrical grid. We have had brownouts and blackouts during festivals because the electricity supply couldn't handle the sheer number of people. So yes, there's some benefits, there's some economic benefits, there's some um, social benefits of people feeling good about hosting a successful festival in the community, and there are some drawbacks. And um, we're here to talk about gathering in the comments Yes, we want to revitalize and renew and um, inject life into communities. But there's some there's some growing pains that go with these festivals. Josh mentioned this uh, festival producing machine that I like talk about it has kind of become and people jokingly say or even some bumper stickers, if we host it, we will come. Why do people want to come to this community where I now live? It's beautiful. It's hard to get to. It's somewhat remote. People, I think, envision, oh, I'm going to the wilds of the Rocky Mountains, you know, for the Bluegrass Festival or for the Tyrite Film Festival, and that's romantic or maybe adventuresome or a bit daring. Uh, it's a beautiful place. 
kids, and um, it has become this destination host for gatherings, for festivals. So um, these are a variety of different slides I selected uh, just to show um, some of the, the crowds uh, from the perspective of, of the stage of what can happen uh, that was uh, a few years ago at the uh, Blues and Bruce Festival. It was just this past weekend, and I didn't see for that. So I, like many people in Telluride, are involved with the festival circuit. We, we put money in our pockets for doing various things at the festivals. I have friends who have been in Telluride longer than I have. They leave town for festivals. They're over the festivals. Uh, maybe they rent their house out on VRBO or Airbnb, or maybe they just shut it down and they go camp in the Utah desert in Park County, borders the state of Utah, about 52 miles to the west. And some people are over the festivals, some people welcome the festivals with open arms. The town of Telluride has worked very closely with festival promoters to try to make this uh, symbiotic relationship work. And the town, uh, Benefits the town of Telluride is a surcharge, I know for a fact, on music festivals, three dollars per day per weekend. The town puts into their pocket. So, if those 15,000 people going into the park, the town's making some money every day. Businesses make money. Um, there's some drawbacks, there's some benefits. Derek's telling me that my time is up. So, um, I would like to uh, say thank you for listening. Thank you online. And our next uh, speaker will be uh, Mary Ann, who is uh, sporting her radically rural t shirt and her matching tennis shoes. Take it away, Mary Ann. Thank you uh, for all that preceded. I feel like I almost have nothing left to say. You know, one of the things when uh, Sarah was working on her talk over the summer, we had some conversations, and I heard you mention it yesterday, but um, I had this class in college that um, was probably my most mind-blowing one, and one where uh, afterwards, so related to I with a friend about an idea, which was probably one of the first times I did that in college. I was usually not talking about ideas, <laughs> but uh, it was um, uh, this idea that you know, if you just look at a starry sky, you know, they're stars, but we've named the Big Dipper, we've named our minds. So when you look up in the sky, you see them. But all the ones that don't have a name, you, you don't see. They're just part of the, the background. And I, I love the work that you're doing. It starts to give a name to, to something that I think is very important for communities, especially rural communities. You know, I just don't oh, have a name for that yet, but like you're starting to develop. Uh, nomenclature and you know, ideas and um, study around it and best practices and you know, that's really, I think that is really important. So the, the background of uh, uh, Radically Rural uh, really started with, I think, um, you know, I started Hannah Bryan's Marketplace 24 years ago. So it was a, um, a local product store. It that was before the My Local Movement. I was making soap. Seemed as if nobody in King wash because I couldn't sell my soap here. <laughs> so, you know, the friends making beautiful things and, um, you know, some of my craft fairs at best. And, you know, it's kind of that gray tag thing. You all know the look of driving into a town and there's kind of a dusty craft store ran by, you know, the artists that make it kind of their own reading book when you walk in. Um, so it's really, you know, Panhard's Marketplace was. Uh, Time to create a marketplace for locally made and grown product. Um, and, and it was also designed to uh, help build the businesses of the people who make and grow those products. The other thing I saw was that um, you know, there was mostly a lack of uh, business skills that people were making stunning things. And that if we wanted to have more of those in our life, they really needed to be a little more economically viable. So between providing a marketplace and providing uh, business skills, really helping to, to elevate that. And you know, the timing was right. Um, that was 1997, around 2000 is where the uh, local movement really exploded on the scene. We 
room that was established in Chicago uh, Road, uh, in the last 24 years. So, so we were doing that, uh, and we uh, ran that from 1997 to 2006, and then had the opportunity to, in a separate location, start this um, uh, business incubator, which has grown to be an incubator, public in space, a bunch of uh, programs and just other things that help our community and help our entrepreneurs. But it was doing that over time and really diving into the entrepreneurship thing that I realized there was a difference between entrepreneurship and you know uh, business incubators and the word that really words, you know, what people thought. It was really those shiny objects that we see in uh, urban areas, you know, they were they were cool, it was skinny jeans, it was all of this stuff. And beyond that, uh, the, the, the books, the, the theories, the study, the, the um, you know, of entrepreneurship has all tended toward this replicable, scalable, saleable businesses, which is not, for the most part, the businesses we were seeing. So it's kind of this gradual, like, you know, you know, more and more started using the word rural entrepreneurship, you know, rural entrepreneurship, uh, rural entrepreneurs, you know, a uh, program for, you know, rural entrepreneurs. I just, that just slipped into my uh, vocabulary without me really noticing it for a while until, until I did. And, you know, I think what I really did is when we started, you know, a pitch program, it, it became pitch work. You know, like, let's have fun. This is a rural area. And we are not, you know, really a lot of comments yesterday at the uh, pitch for competition was how collaborative it was, how the pitch team was a team. One had to win $10,000, but the rest of them, like, felt like they were all winners. They all got something out of it. We had somebody back from a prior year who said, I got $50,000 worth of business out of pitching. I didn't win. <laughs> and he, he had tried twice and he didn't win. And, you know, it's just, you know, those were just good comments. They, you know, they really, it's a program. We view it as a program. It ends up in a pitch. But uh, we have a signature cocktail at the shore. You know, it's, it's fun. We just make it fun. And I think that's the difference uh, between rural and urban. It's like it's, it's laid back, it's collaborative, and there is a different um, mode of entrepreneurship. So um, uh, the King's Idol, along with Hand Grimes, launched this. Be radically rural, and it started out of uh, for those of you that attended the wonderful event that last night. Um, we that was 15 years for us, and um, it just started with us. We had kind of graduates from business groups, um, and I was thinking, like, it would be nice to connect those, they're connected to each other, but let's connect them, um, the groups to each other. So, we started up at Allison's Orchard, which is one of our graduates, and it was. Informal and you know, just kind of grew to about 150 people for us. And then the Sentinel said, You know, we'd love to partner with you on that. So we did it in town here, and 420 people showed up. And we sort of looked around, and, you know, I don't know if it's some people here or there, but people were looking around and saying, Where did these people come? There's a lot of young people, they were dressed up, they had hats on, they had other, like cool hats, not bad hats. You know, it just, you know, it was just like, you know, Terry and I looked at each other and said, you know, there's something here. There was this energy. It was just amazing. And, and how do we build on that? And so we went up to Badger Company, the rural rural gifts of nature, ships um, Badger Home and all sorts of other amazing wonderful things uh, worldwide, you know, from this little place up in Hillsome. Uh, I talked to their creative founder, uh, which is the light, uh, and that, you know, out of this discussion with his team and Terry, we, we actually, interestingly enough, came up with this idea of like, we'd like a South by Southwest type event, but for rural. That energy, the music, the experience, you know, and that's where I'm doing, I keep thinking all sorts of words, but we have, you know, talked from the beginning, which was kind of the hard part of you know, going virtual last year of wanting people to have an experience here. We have built in that time to talk to each other, to have a long lunch together, not stuff something down, to have a long lunch downtown. 
um, pick up the local coffee from our local coffee shops, uh, have a glass of wine and a cocktail on the back deck of 21. You know, just really take those ideas in, you know, we'll discuss about them, you know, to really genuinely meet people that, that you see. And we've given um, a long time to the workshops, they're not 20 minutes, not 45 minutes, they're not an hour. Um, they were two hours, actually. We cut them back so that we could start a little later um, so that the West Coast people could, could come in. Um, so they're about an hour and 45. It gives us time to really dive into the topic. Um, I was asked, so that's a little bit of the background and just how this kind of came along. And I think it was a natural asset, right? It just kind of naturally grew. Um, the things that the organization has gotten out of it and a few of the things that Keen has gotten out of it, it is a lot of the things that you've mentioned. But I know um, for the Sentinel and for Hannah Vines, I think for Hannah Vines as a nonprofit organization, um, we've tended to connect a little bit more you know, outside of the region to, to funders and other groups doing similar things. But I think for the Sentinel, it was I that, you know, first of all, you know, the kind of money that could be raised at just at a time when a lot of newspapers are starting to fundraise. Uh, so I think it positioned them really well to be successful in doing that during the pandemic and, and the on the year, exploring the option of um, becoming a nonprofit and mission driven organization, which is a trend across the country, which Terry knows because he's been organizing the, um, the community journalism track and talking to people, being at the leading edge, and being invited to conferences. So, so for the track leaders, myself included, for the entrepreneur track, and we also have arts and culture and ministry, um, and land and community, arts and culture. The track leaders um, for this event are reaching out all over the country. They're making amazing connections. We're pulling in amazing ideas, leading edge ideas uh, that are focusing on what is working? You know, how do we go forward? So, you know, I think having having something like this in town uh, really, really benefits um, the all of the individuals, and it's a huge effort to pull it off, and um, gives us um, national values that really we all know. You know, that, um, the Kauffman Foundation did a study years ago on entrepreneurship, and the number one indicator of success for an entrepreneur is it's network. So, you know, here's a town now, and I bet, you know, tell you guys the same, that has a network. You can call on people um, from all over the country. You have all these new connections, which is, you know, just super powerful. So that's, you know, that's something we need to get at. I think, you know, another thing that worked well for the organization and the guys is that as we understood uh, more deeply that Rural entrepreneurship is different and it needs to study. You know, the famous desire of how do we share that? How do we build that network with other entrepreneur development organizations around the country? And for us, this also then gave um, venue, um, separate from you know, the conference in the town, but for any funds to start reaching out to other organizations like ours in a more meaningful way to start having this conversation about how, how do we drive the sort of the model of rural what does it look like? Is there some university someplace that might take this on and own that? But you know, like really just starting that conversation um, and bringing those people together. You know, like Sarah was saying in the keynote, it starts with people and it starts with that. So you know, I think for the organization, Hannah Vines, that you know, it's really given us a vehicle to reach out and to reach in. That is a uh, organization that's hard sometimes to, you know, you've got a mission here and, you know, the board and everybody wants you to work here. And I come from the mission director, well, oh, no, there's this thing. So starting this separate thing and being able to then, you know, after a couple of years, get funding for a full time person makes me feel like, you know, she's our universal joint between the work we're doing here and we can stay focused on it and all of the things we want to connect to out there. And, and continue to be open to grow. So that's, um, you know, I think the, the benefit from this, you know, the organizations that have been involved, the benefit from the environment, and um, all the benefit from the town. But what 
but I really hope um, one of the things you know, that I think really helps urban areas succeed is this concept of density and, and Louise Rabbit and Jacob's work. You know, it's really at the intersection of busy places, you know, and a company is, is sales talking to engineering. It's those intersections where great ideas happen. And in urban areas, there's just a lot more things to collide and create new things. And if we can build this radically rural network um, and build density through that, you know, that is where I think we can start getting the collision of ideas um, that will explode even more ideas beyond this chicken and share in the uh, And that's, you know, we look forward to doing that, especially now um, Juliana Donaldson, who's our uh, medical rural director, just started in March, which we can talk about easing, poor thing. Um, but, uh, you know, we're now going to have a full year. We've got a hybrid um, event under our belt, which was super challenging. And we didn't think in advance they have seven tag teams because we have seven locations. Um, you know, and then also, you know, to, to your work, um, one of the uh, connected, so our connected at tech teams, and one of the things was Main Street 2.0. What happens with Main Street as retail is shrinking down? And so one of the um, displays or ideas presented was Kina's conference center. And, you know, it's that idea of like, you know, we don't have a huge venue, but we have a bunch of really cool smaller spaces. And, you know, so Radically Rural was a way of testing out Kina as a conference center. And like, you know, and then being able to share that with other rural communities. Other rural communities have spaces, um, you know, you have the churches, you may have a town meeting hall, you may have a courthouse, a conference center, you have all of all of this stuff. Um, but I think um, people who are going to conferences are looking for different experiences than the one we saw on that slide. Uh, and we do want to walk around and get some sunshine or snow or rain or whatever it is between venues. They want to have coffee from the bakers of high most, um, not from some big warming kettle in the hallway. And you know, I think it's an opportunity for rural uh, areas to create an offbeat conference center uh, and attract really cool uh, people and develop a name for yourself and an identity around what works for you. So, uh, you know, I really want to thank Rick for organizing the track and for the three peers for really organizing this and just letting me step into it. But it's uh, I'm definitely taking notes and uh, look forward to the exercise and the QA. So, thank you. We're going to take a quick break. Everybody stretch for the bathroom. Grab some water, and then we're going to do our exercise. Thank you. Thank you for your talent. So we're calling this picture gathering. And so we're going to have all the groups. The work will start off individually, but then you as a group, you guys will decide on something similar to yesterday. You'll decide on something to present and pitch. All the so um, I'll leave the rest to Ashley to explain. Thanks, Gary. Let's get right into it. So um, there is paper, and there's some sharpies, I think, on every table. Avail yourself to the writing implements in the paper. Let's begin. Here's the first uh, question. Why is your town where it is? Maybe just a sentence. Why is your town where it is in terms of Proximity to water, proximity to an urban area, proximity to a mountain or forest or any kind of natural features that might define where your town is. Maybe you've never thought about that. Now's your chance to write it down. Why is your town where it is? What was the establishing event that led to a settlement in that location? Maybe there is no establishing event, but if there is, write that down. So I'm repeating, this is our, our first question. Why is your town where it is? And what was the establishing event that led to a settlement in that location? 
and it doesn't have to be a settlement of white people. Do you need some more time on that or ready to go to the next question? Let's keep going. Number two, what are the most significant events in the town's history slash trajectory? And some examples may be railroad, canal, epidemic, forest fire. What are the most significant events in the town's history or tra trajectory? Next question. Is your town known for anything, or maybe it used to be known for something? For example, in Fitzwilliam, the railroad used to stop there. It does not anymore. Does it have a nickname, maybe commemorating some as aspect of its identity? <laughs> and Derek just reminded me uh, for people who are uh, tuning in virtually we will give you an opportunity to chime in so play along at home please okay let's keep moving why do you live there why do you live where you live now Next question, what are the town's greatest potential assets, resources, and latent economic potential? Maybe natural beauty, recreation, human capital, skills, knowledge, infrastructure, buildings, factories, facilities, et cetera. What are the town's greatest potential or existing assets, resources, and latent economic potential, maybe untapped economic potential. Next question. Consider these through the lens of changes happening in the world. Does it make any of these more necessary or impactful? Everyone get that? Sure. Consider these through the lens of changes happening in the world. Does it make any of these more necessary, impactful? And that's uh, partnering with the previous question about what are the town's greatest potential assets, resources, latent economic potential. So sort of follow up, consider these, those attributes through the lens of changes happening in the world. And does it make any of these more necessary or impactful? Make sense? You folks at home, make sense? Good. Next question. What is needed to better take advantage of these assets? What is needed to better take advantage of these assets? I hear furious writing. We can hear it with the ballpoint pen, it wouldn't have the same sound. Next question Is there some kind of event that could bring energy to assets, create awareness, utilize skills, unite community? Maybe you need some assistance from the group. You can ask people at your table if you need to brainstorm a little bit. I'll repeat that again. Is there some kind of event that could bring energy to that asset, such as creating awareness, utilizing skills, uniting the community? And if you need some help, you may ask a friend. Does anyone need any of those questions or topics repeated? You have it? Are 
audience online. You're following along. Good. All right. Now, I'd like you to kind of circle up with the other people at your table and work together as a group on this next section. Okay, so everyone can share what they've written down with the group. You can take turns and just read what you've written down. And the group can pick uh, a group leader or pick uh, one story to develop into a pitch for a new gathering. So read what everyone's written down and share. And maybe the group can pick one story to develop into a pitch for a new gathering. Anything you consider? Know, probably not to read all nine points or whatever, but find the most interesting aspect. Of consider it. what is it? Why is it here? How can it lead to year round jobs, industry, etc.? Who can help? Area organizations, institutions. So discuss and come up with a pitch for a new event based on what you have written about your community. And maybe write down that pitch and then pick someone to be the spokesperson who can present that. Okay, panelists, come up to the stage, please. Panelists to the stage. Panelists, Miriam, Ashley, up to the stage. So um, we're going to. We're going to borrow a bit from Pitchfork yesterday. We're going to, the panelists will be, um, let's think of the panelists as your town council or um, the board trustees or um, maybe their funders for an event. And you guys are pitching your event to the group. And so um, we're going to do these two tables over here first. And then we'll see if there's anybody in the at home or in the virtual audience that would like to pitch their events. Um, Todd will um, read those to us, and then we'll do a couple here, and then we'll use that this conversation to launch into just a more general Q and A, and we'll talk about maybe what we heard and any other questions from from the presentations earlier. So this could be the launching point for the new 2022 Temple, New Hampshire UFO Festival. I'm just saying, this this could happen out of this room. Um, so table table number one, would you like to start us off? And just a reminder, what we're looking for is name of your gathering, where it is, and why is it there? What is going to happen at this gathering? And importantly, what is the leave behind? Like, why are you doing this in this community? What will be the lasting impact? Hello. Okay, so we took a really um, kind of meta <laughs> approach to this, and um, instead of thinking about a particular event, we were thinking about how we can help communities facilitate good events and 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 build that um, kind of lasting impact around having events, kind of like in, in Telluride. Um, and so the name that um, we came up with is the Agile Event Collaborative. Um, and this could be used in, in any city, but we kind of, um, or any community, but we talked about Keen as an example where there are already a lot of resources um, or a lot of um, events happening, um, but not everybody necessarily has uh, equitable access to resources to put on events and to gather people in the way um, that they might want to. Because, you know, as Marianne is very aware and, uh, and everyone involved with this conference, it takes a lot. Um, and so basically what um, we would be doing is being kind of an open source resource for people to use um, as kind of a one-stop shop for event planning. So, um, you know, having access to um, being able to refer people to tech resources, to accessibility consultants, to um, 
you know, um, to different venues that, that are often amicable to hosting events, um, anything that would kind of be a helpful service directory for uh, event organizers and coordinators. And we're hoping that the lasting impact on this is that um, more people in the community will feel empowered to host events um, that have to do with things that they care about. Um, and so then we can see a greater diversity of event kind of content areas and activities and stuff happening, which really adds to the kind of lasting cultural richness in the community. So yeah. <laughs> I love it. Group number two. Well, group, thank you for trusting in me. Um, our town is called Lubeck, Maine. I live there. I've lived there at least 10 years and another 10 years nearby. I can see Canada from my house. I live a quarter mile from the bridge uh, to New Brunswick and Campobello Island. And for the last year and a half, families who have marriages between Canadians and Americans could not visit. So we would create an event You've certainly heard of it, and we want to bring it to our place. It's called, it's called TEDx First Light. The First Light is, is a Wabanaki reference to the first people who were there. And we are uh, where we live. We're the easternmost point in America, which is part of the reference to First Light. Um, we are proposing. Um, to get licenses from TEDx to do back-to-back -back two days of TEDx celebration. And um, the history of our town is that Water Street is uh, still lined with old sardine packing factories. And that's what the history is. We've had as many as 5,000 people living there um, in the heyday of, of sardines, which was like 1930s and 1940s. Um, I think a lot about the border. This is partly because in 2013, I organized the Bay of Fundy International Marathon, which goes from the last lighthouse in America to the first lighthouse in Canada. It involved crossing the international border and working with customs and emergency services on both sides and getting um, nobody runs through with a passport, but you register in advance and every name is cleared by uh, Border Patrol on both sides. It's very complex, but there is a historical relationship between our community of 1,300 and the island Canadian community of 900. Um, and we'd like to get a TEDx Campobello and a TEDx First Light as an annual gathering. Awesome, thank you. I love it. Um, let's see, if, do we have any uh, members that if for, we monitor for questions? But, uh, yeah, can yeah. I do the virtual audience? Yeah, sure. Let's I'll check just it. check in now. You have to wait for everything else, so let's give them priority now. I don't see any pitches coming in through the chat. Okay. Yet. We have so, two more in the room. But and if, then, if the virtual participants maybe want to submit something via the chat, you can. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. All right. Group number three. Um, so I live in a small town called Temple. It's on the far east side of the Monadnock region. So our pitch is for uh, an event called Temple Trail Mix. Uh, our town is known for farming and agriculture as well as recreational <laughs> trails for both people and horses. So I would love to see uh, 
some sort of um, marriage between um, agriculture and our trails, which is why we call it trail mix. People that live in Temple refer to it as the best kept secret in the Monadnock region. It's not on the main road, it's sort of off the beaten path. Um, and the residents really kind of like it that way, I have to say, sometimes. Um, but we do want to support local agriculture. Um, and then, you know, one of the challenges is that everyone is facing is around development and housing. So this is a way to sort of get people thinking creatively about intentional development, um, including possibly agri agrihoods where we might have some cluster housing with a farm aspect. But the event itself would be focused on um, something like 60 to 70% of our residents have some sort of food source on their property, whether it's a, just a garden or it's animals or it's you know a larger food production, maybe they're supplying restaurants. So it'd be great to have some way to highlight all the local food. And then also in partnership with the Conservation Commission, um, maybe they could highlight what are the native edible species. I don't know what everyone else is seeing in their region, but we have an explosion of mushrooms <laughs> in Temple this year, and a lot of them are edible. So it would be great to perhaps have satellite locations around town where people are leading, um, you know, people around the trails to point out what's edible and what's native. So. Um, that's why we call it trail mix, a combination of food and recreation. I think it's great. It's awesome. Full circle back to hunter gatherers. I'd like to point out all mushrooms are edible once. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually have a pitch from one of our virtual participants. Awesome. So, uh, Let's hear it. I think I'm on camera right now. Um, so this is from. Uh, mod in East Hampton, Massachusetts, um, and the name of the, the festival is East Hampton Passport. Why in East Hampton? Uh, it's rich with artists, musicians, and creative businesses. What happens? A uh, weekend downtown festival, activation, attendees get a little design booklet as passport in advance of the day. Uh, it's low cost. Uh, and move between partner businesses and public spaces with live local music to collect artist design stamps. Uh, the lasting impact, folks get to know East Hampton better, connect with artists and musicians um, with the opportunity to take away artwork, the stamps, and music, merchandise, uh, artists, musician connections. Uh, they get to connect with new audiences, uh, host businesses, get new customers, surrounding cafes and restaurants get day of business uh, that's hopefully rec recurring in the future. So thank you, Maude, from East Hampton. Great. Fantastic. And our last group. One more last group. I am from Wilma, uh, New Hampshire, and it's not known for anything at all. And uh, it has no nickname. I've asked around, never has. And people look puzzled when you ask them about this business of having a nickname. Um, in the early 19th century, it was one of the many uh, towns that was big into sheep farming. And they shipped everything down to Newport, uh, to the mills in Newport. In the late 19th century, there were a lot of mills of many types uh, along the brooks uh, in Wilmette. And then in the early 19th century, they, they all went away. And then in 1938, they were all swept away. <laughs> so there's nothing. Um, that was the famous hurricane of 38. Um, so what there is there now is a lot of mountains, brooks, and ponds, and trees, and a lot of trees. Um, and there, it, you, and when I was, I, I'm a summer kid. I was coming up to this region from the 1960s uh, till now. Um, and I've moved back here full time. When I was a kid in the 60s, they still had square dances. And they, they still had them at the Grange. And, and there was still a farming community. But 
that was the last gasp. And I would like to revive it and bring people back to that tradition. Not that it'd be great to have the agricultural again. And that's a whole other topic. But the music, um, I would like to bring back. Um, and so I, I, propose, I, did, I gave it a new name. <laughs> uh, I'd like to propose the Bog Mountain Music mu Musical Festival, uh, or Music Festival, because that's Bog Mountain is the highest point in town. It's right in the center of town, and the whole idea of having a Bog Mountain is just strange. So, um, so we have many spaces in town um, where you could have music workshops. And I, I, I used to be a music journalist. I know a lot of journalists, a lot of musicians. And I know that they like to teach because they, they get paid for it. And they get paid more than they do to just to play. And, and they, like to, they like to make more musicians. It's, it's like having children. And so they, uh, they I, I know, you know, we're not that far from Boston. And we're not that far from Pioneer Valley and Western Mass, both of which have huge traditional music and singer-songwriter communities who would probably be happy to come up to central New Hampshire in the middle of nowhere and, uh, and teach people to play and to write music. And so that is uh, what I would like to see happen in Wilma is to, to revive this square dancing and, and, uh, and traditional music scene that, that just about died about 50 years ago. <laughs> Um, it's still pretty there, and the spaces like the town hall and various churches and some of the old school houses are, are still there, and so they're acoustically sound, and, and it would be a good place to just do this. And uh, it was suggested that it would be nice to have um, a sort of uh, a, a school, a sort of titular school, and that events be scattered through the year. Um, and, and then have a, a sort of an organizing central festival once a year, but have smaller events throughout. So that, that's the pitch. Wow, thank you. I think it's great. I'd um, like to attend these festivals. We're lucky that we don't have a um, fixed sum of money. We can actually give, we can fund all of these. Yeah. So uh, you all win. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I I know we're so late on time, but if there's like anyone that's a burning question, um, and if anybody needs to leave, totally understand. But um, I'd love to get yeah a little bit of some Bob Mountain and Music Festival. What's, what's the first? What's the first step? I, from my perspective, is to start with the idea. That's the first step and get some buy-in um, from the town, the county, the community, get people on board and start developing the network. And I, I, I think you will be amazed at how many people want to help, some a lot and some a little. But I think if you start with the idea and you develop the network, you'll get some excellent people to buy into it and, and just help move it forward. And I, I have a resource for that. There's a book called Vivid Vision, and it really talks about making sure that you have clearly thought through and explained what your vision is, because that's when you get buy-in from people. If you just kind of throw it out there, then people put their own thing on it. And sometimes you throw an idea out before you really fully um, certain what it is. So it's a pretty short book, but it's um, we're using it all over the place here for whatever, whether it's a business or you know, an idea for a food hub in town. Like, get your vivid vision down first, then start talking to people about it, and then let it morph. You don't have to be the end all, but like in your mind, make it happen, and then leave room for it to change later. But uh, that's I think that's really important. I have a follow-up question. Is the second step finding money? Or, or is there something before that? You know, I think, I, I think it's um, money, you know, like 
really having people on board, really having, I think money follows where something's going to happen, whether or not you fund it or not. So I think if, if you can pro prototype it in some small way and then start iterating, you know, Radically Rural grew out of the Connect event, um, you know, having some big plan. And it was the second year of Radically Rural. You know, I remember talking to the Kaufman Foundation, you know, about funding and being involved. And, you know, they, the, the very first year, they started out and um, came along the second year, you know, because it, it happened, you know, there was a proof. And, you know, when you can start getting uh, that, so start, you know, yeah, give it a little prototype, give it a start um, and take as many pictures as you can and, and then, you know, Roll it forward would be my thought. I love that idea. Sorry, I just wanted to. That, I love that idea of prototyping it um, because I, I, I think that a lot of times with a lot of things, not just events, but they, it's easy to get caught up in like the grand vision. And like, if I don't have the grand vision, I don't have the thing. But you can actually start to sort of build incrementally with that vision over time. Yeah, there's uh, in project management. There's two kinds. There's the classic project management where you've got this project, you spell it out, and that's really good to do if you know exactly how it's gonna go. But something like that, you don't know. It's the first time, you don't know how it's gonna work. And so then you fall into agile project management. And the, the idea behind agile is you, do, you take a small step and then you see what happens and you feed back into the next step. So even looking at like agile project management, you know, I'll give a quick example from one of our businesses. Um, uh, it was a compost uh, company. They were picking up compost at people's home and they were wondering if they should go into another town. And the Agile project management consultant said, you know, sh show up in Peterborough with a clipboard at the dump and ask people if, if they'd be interested. And they got enough feedback from them to do, you know, so it's something you can do in a week. Um, and, uh, you know, it might just be a phone call. It might be going, standing at the dump, but, you know, planning it along that way too is just because it's so new and there's so much unknown that you need to take a step. And, and then the important thing is what feedback did you get from doing that? If you have a small gathering in town, what did you learn from that? You know, what, what can you do that's small that you can do quickly and learn from? Um, I understand we have some audience questions. Yeah, we, we, we have a question uh, that actually came up during the presentations, during Josh's presentation, actually, um, uh, related to some of the, the information you're citing, I believe, from the Knight Foundation about the um, correlation between events and economic uh, impact. And Adam was asking, um, you know, is there any evidence that shows uh, a similar correlation uh, you know, over over the last five to ten years. Uh, how certain are we that the correlation remains uh, is strong today? And I, I don't know if, if you can reach back to about forty five minutes ago to bring that <laughs> yeah, to no, the current context. I, I mean, I was I was aware of that when I when I cited that study. Um, it's it's eleven years old now, going on twelve years old. Um, I wasn't able to find anything. Uh, a, a there's no follow-up, to my knowledge, to that specific study. Like that, they didn't go back and do it again. Uh, there's a lot in event literature and placemaking literature about sort of the effect of events and the effect or the effect on place. And what I was really looking for was something that sort of like ties them all up nicely. And that was that was really the best thing I found for our purposes. There's probably a lot of academic literature out there, but I, I, I can't say definitively that that those correlations are as certain in 2021 as they were in 2010. But again, I think it's an interesting uh, reference point and a touch point to start thinking about, um, if, you know, thinking about gathering in terms of a placemaking strategy, in terms of an economic development strategy, and how you can start to think about events and their, um, in their kind of middle term to long term impact on the community versus, you know, just looking at, like, how much money did we make or, how much, you know, that, that kind of thing. So that was really my intention. Um, so I, I hope I didn't lead anybody too far awry by citing something that is uh, really no longer holds. Um, so I, I, I would take it as a jumping off. Great, thanks. 
Um, any last questions from the in room audience? Yeah. Well, I have a million, but I feel like we shouldn't hold people away from that mixer, which is just getting started. So, um, so I want to thank everybody for the for coming, for the great um, participation, the great um, thoughtfulness, and all of your your um, your events you organized. Um, and thank Rick, of course, uh, Marianne and Hannah Grimes and everyone here. So um, please um, stay in touch, and um, I'll see you. Uh, where's the the mixers happening? Somewhere across the way there. So. <laughs>